as you can tell, and maybe you probably can't tell, <laughs> VBS is an extremely chaotic and awesome event. And with this in the background and, and what we've been walking through, it's been extremely trying. And I was amazed each and every night at the grace of the Lord upon the leaders who were aware, upon the church in general, and for the kids. Those kids had so much fun. And there was not a single bigger kid that was there than Linda Clark. <laughs> and I know she doesn't want to be noticed or attention. But I'm so thankful for the passion and the compassion in those whose desire to help and to show up and to, and to sow their time and their money and, and, and decorating. And it's, I am awed. At the capacity that the Lord has for grace. Because if you'd have known what we've been walking through, and it's extremely trying. Even last week, the grace to worship and the grace to give the word. The last thing I wanted to do was stand up here this way. But ultimately, it was made very clear that it's not about us. It's just not about us. We've been reading in Second Peter. We've been going through it verse by verse. And it is so clear what Peter is speaking. He's speaking that for false teachers, it's about them. It's about them. It's about what they can get, how they can be seen. But in the Christian kingdom, in God's kingdom, the kingdom where Jesus is king, it is not about us. It is about him. I feel like I'm doing my best way to transition here. I can just give me some allowance here. 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm not going to read a single verse in 2 Peter today because I don't believe that's the Lord's heart. Verse by verse in 2 Peter. But 2 Peter chapter 3, what is happening and what is going on is Peter's getting ready to die and the end is coming and he's giving his dying words. And in the portion of scripture that we're going to enter into next, not this week, but next, he is literally just talking about the end. Second Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13, Peter starts to speak of the end. We sung about it today. For us, the end he's speaking of, the, the fiery judgment upon the earth, which we talked about last week, the end that he's speaking of is just the beginning for us. In the end, the Lord's return and the judgment of sin is very much a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe it is not preached enough. Why is it not preached enough? It is not preached enough in fear of embracing escapism. And so we don't preach it. But it is part of the gospel, and it must be preached. We as the bride should have a longing for a husband to return for us. And it's not about escapism. I'm not embracing escapism. I am just longing for the one whom I love and whom my, he loves me to return to rule and reign. Because only at that moment in time will things on this earth be right. That's my desire. It's not him returning for returning his sake. It's because I long to be with him. As I long to see him come and to sit upon a throne in Jerusalem and to rule in that moment, in that time, for those a thousand years, for there to be peace on the earth. Why? Because the king of peace has returned in glory, not as a babe in a manger, but as the king of peace to rule and to reign. And at the end of that period of time, when Satan is loosed again for a short period of time, and the final battle occurs, and all sin is purged from this earth, and the new heaven and the new earth, how glorious will that be? And from, that, from this moment till then, our responsibility is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to make him known, and to deliver him to those who are hurting and needy, and to our brothers who are hurting and needy, to the lost who are hurting and needy. So I lied. I did preach some of Second Peter there. But you have to understand, in the Old Testament, 1,845 references to the second coming of the Lord, to the end, are mentioned in the Old Testament. That's a lot. In the New Testament, 318 scriptures are used referring to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament are of the second coming of the Lord. It means out of the 27 books in the New Testament, 23 mention the second coming and the return of our Lord. 
For every prophecy of Scripture that speaks of Jesus coming as a babe in a manger, there are eight regarding his second coming. We should be speaking about it. We should be looking, as Titus says, to his glorious appearing. That looking is a fervent scanning of the horizon. Like, think about Christopher Columbus when they left, not knowing where they were going. They left Europe, and they were going to the new world. And they thought it would take such and such time. And when they got close to the time, they thought that it would take. Imagine those sailors running out of food, maybe getting claustrophobic, maybe just getting tired of dealing with a neighbor, looking and scanning the horizon for the land, the, the, the release of this voyage that they've been on. That's how we're going to be looking for his glorious appearing. And when it doesn't come, two things happen. We spoke about it last week. The scoffers, they're not coming. He's not coming. Things have always been the same. That can be one. Or we can be hardened in our hearts to the return of the Lord Jesus and go live our own life the way that we please. There is a, I don't know what it's called. It's a, a trend in Christianity to deconstruct your faith. In the deconstruction process, one of the number one issues that they have and why they start deconstructing their faith, and ultimately not being in faith with the Lord at all, is that the Lord's return has been preached and yet he hasn't returned. But as we spoke last week, he is delaying. Peter says very clearly his return because he is long-suffering and desires that none should perish. That should bring us joy, not contempt for our God who loves all. I was speaking yesterday with somebody, and they're like, yes, the Lord is going to return, but, but I have unsaved loved ones. That's why he waits. That's why he waits, because he knows that, and he desires their heart as well. And so it's not an escapism that we're embracing, but we should be excited about seeing the one who purchased our lives through his blood upon the cross. That's what Peter is bringing it out. We have to come to this understanding that whether we like it or not, or whether we believe it or not, or whether there's books written about it or not, Jesus is returning. That's not changing. It's not changing. And we will be attacked for saying it, but he is returning. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. I believe... That was an introduction that may you not connect to what we're getting about ready to go into. But Jesus returning is part of the gospel. And the number one issue that I have, and you will hear at the end of this sermon when I'm speaking to you, when you hear my heart. Is there's been a turning away from the gospel of Jesus Christ to other things. I'm not saying bad things. But in my mind and in my heart, every doctrine other than Jesus is a lesser doctrine. It doesn't mean it can't be taught. It doesn't mean it's not part of the kingdom or part of Christianity. It's just lesser. To me, I read it in John chapter 3, verse 31 this morning. Jesus, the one who came from heaven, is above all. A few weeks ago, I spoke out of Luke chapter 10. And Jesus said, Mary has chosen the needed part, the one thing. When we look at these scriptures, when the first commandment and the greatest commandment Jesus spoke out of all the Old Testament commandments was to love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And the gospel of Mark acts or adds and with your strength. Why did he say that? Because that's what's coming from the heart of Jesus. He really wants you to love him. And out of that comes the second commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor as yourself or go and reach the lost if you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ first. And when I, read, when I read words like love your neighbor, or, I'm sorry, love the Lord God with all your heart, with every motive that's inside of me, it ought to be to love him first. With all your mind, every thought taken to be captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ so that every thought glorifies him. Am I, if I'm having thoughts in my mind of self-harm, if I'm having thoughts in my mind of adultery or lust, if I'm having thoughts in my mind to be unfaithful in any way, that's not pleasing to the Lord, and I'm not loving the Lord God with all my might. To love him with all my soul, my entirety of my being, everything surrendered to him and all of my strength, all of my activity. Why were so many people here past midnight working on VBS, coming in on Tuesdays? Why would they even show up to handle a preschool class of 20 kids that are like chickens just running everywhere? I, I was in charge of them Wednesday night. I said, I'm not doing this. We're going outside to the bounce house. And, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't be in here anymore with them. And it's not because I didn't love them, but it just, oh, I needed air. 
Why do we do that? Because our activity, our strength should be because we love the Lord Jesus. I do it because I love the kids, yes, but I can only love those kids, those snotty, poopy kids. <laughs> I had some. And there's a story behind that, by the way. I better tell it. Just being honest. We're cleaning up after VBS. It's like 9.15 at night. We know, we're all exhausted. It's the last night. And I'm back here, and I know that the mom of this kid is, was out there in the parking lot last time I saw her. And all, all of a sudden, I hear this big, loud scream, like, hey! This is the loudest scream I heard. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, somebody's in trouble. And I'm, 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 I'm waiting, like, did I hear her scream? And I hear it again. It's real high pitch because the, he's very young, right? How old is he, Lisa? He's four. <laughs> He's four. And I hear this, hey. And he's just like, anybody. And I'm like, what in the world? So I, I go into the bathroom. And there's little Archer on the toilet. And I'm like, okay. I said, hey, Archer. He's like, hey. You know. I said, did you go to the bathroom? He goes, yeah. Did you go poop? Yeah. And then I'm like, well, last time I saw Lisa, she was in conversation. I went her up out in the parking lot. I said, is it okay if I wipe you? She goes, yeah. <laughs> so there's the story behind that. But we do that, why? Because, yes, I love Archer, and I love Lisa, and I love our church family, but I love the Lord. You know what I mean? That's just, this has got to be a heart song. Does that make sense? And then it was so great, because <laughs> I got a text from Lisa later. I'm going to share this. Is that okay? You can say no. She goes, look, if you don't have a pastor willing to wipe your kid's butt, you have the wrong pastor. I said, I am not volunteering for anybody else, okay? It was in the moment, it was spontaneous. If it is needed, we can do that. But that's not my heart song, okay? So, but anyway, so that's the truth. That Why do we do that? Because it's about the Lord. It's about Jesus. Our children are not going to remember that, whatever. But, you know, he talks to me now. There was a time whenever I was at Hyde Archer, he'd go, and he, that was it. That was his response every single time. He doesn't do that anymore to me. So praise God. We're making progress. But Jesus is the all-sufficient one. He's the reason why we exist. You and I were created for him, not church, not gifts, not doctrine, but for him. That's why we exist. He's returning for us to fulfill the covenants that he has made because he is the faithful one. And he's returning because we were for him. And he wants to redeem us. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, I'm going to read this. It's, 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 it's 10 scriptures, I know. I'm going to read it slowly so I don't go too fast. But please hear, I'm going to change some of the words. I'm going to interpret them for you, what they mean, if you don't know what they mean. I'm not changing scripture. So where it says him, I'm going to say Jesus, right, because that's who it's speaking about. But we need to hear this, right? This is so seminal to Christianity. Verse 13, Paul is writing to the church of Colossae, and he's saying this. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness, that is speaking of God the Father, and translated us into the kingdom of his, God the Father's dear son, Jesus Christ. That's the greatest miracle that will ever happen in your life. This translation from the kingdom of darkness, lost in your sin, in the pit of sin, doomed and bound for hell, and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we have redemption. We have been bought. How? Through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Right away, Paul is speaking in chapter 1, the church of Colossae, of Christ and Christ crucified. This is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We must receive that his crucifixion, him on the cross, him dead in a grave and raising again, purchased and bought us. And that we are to do likewise. Jesus is not looking to adjust, change, or conform you in a different way. He's looking to bring you to death and then resurrected again in him to new life, which he sustains. Verse 15, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God that we don't see. He is the firstborn of every creature. And Paul is getting ready to explain that does not mean that he was created. It means he has the preeminence. He has a high place. He has the most high place, exalted place. Verse 16 and 17 are going to prove that out. In verse 16, for by Jesus, all things are created. Things that were in heaven, things that are in earth, things that are seen or not seen, whether they are thrones or their dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus is before all things, and by him, Jesus, all things are held together. 
He is the all-sufficient one. Verse 18, and he, Jesus, he alone is the head of the body, the church. When you come to church, if you're visiting us, I appreciate that. If you have a home church, you're just visiting this morning, you need to be in a church where Jesus is why you're there. Not a pastor, not a worship team, but the Lord. Because if the Lord is in the house, then it truly is a church. If the Lord is not in the house, then it is a social club. My heart and my goal and my desire is for the Lord to be in his house, and that is why you walk through those doors. Because during worship, you feel his presence, and he makes himself known to you, and he encounters you. During the word, my prayer, every time it goes forth, that there would be healings and deliverances and freedom and salvations because the gospel is being preached. That's my prayer during worship. I would love to lay hands on you. So would our team, our prayer team, our altar team, our ministry team. So would our leaders. So would our elders. But ultimately, you don't need us. You need him. And so that's why it's imperative that he is here. And of course, please understand me. It is the Holy Spirit of God who makes his presence known to us. Jesus is seated on a throne. Amen. And he goes on to say, Paul, he continues to write. He is the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. There he is using firstborn in that way that it is spoken there. So that in everything he might have the preeminence, first place. Verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in Jesus all fullness dwell. This is the key verse. This is the thesis to me of this portion of scripture that we're reading. In Jesus, all fullness dwells. Where do I need to go for freedom? To Jesus. Where do I need to go if I want to have a heart and ministry for outreach? To Jesus. Where do I need to go if I want to learn and receive of the giftings of the Holy Spirit? To Jesus. Where do I need to go if I need a restored marriage? To Jesus. What if I have a troubled child? To Jesus. Why are you here today? He brought you here. Why did he bring you here today? For him. Does this make sense? All fullness is dwelling in him. For us to look apart from him for any other thing, we are missing it. And it won't last because then we're going to try something that's not eternal. We need him. The real Jesus, the real God-man seated on a throne who is returning in a body to rule and reign forever. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the Jesus so often I don't hear on any blogger or vlogger or podcast. He's not mentioned. I want to make sure that I mention him. Because he's the one I'm here for. I'm not here for a doctrine. I'm here for him. And he goes on to say, Paul continues to read. Are we receiving this today? I hope so. I have labored over this word, and I believe it is from the Lord for today. He says, and you that were sometime far, uh, were alienated. It means that you were separated from him. And you were enemies, actually, in your own mind by your wicked works. Yet now has Jesus reconciled, brought you near again. Amen. In the body of his flesh, he did this through death. Again, he's preaching the cross. To present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Only Jesus can do that. You cannot do that for yourself. If you continue in the faith, the faith of our Lord Jesus, grounded and settled in him. Grounded and settled in what? Everything I just read of who he is as a preeminence. About creation. About buying you back. About being the fullness of that dwells, the all-sufficient one, the preeminent one, the firstborn of the dead, all of that, if you continue in the faith and grounded and settled in that, what Paul has already laid out, and you are not moved away from the hope of this gospel that you have heard and that we have preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul made a ministry. These both words are so powerful. He is the all and the more that we are seeking. We have a tendency to look at other things, but if we don't keep this before us, then we will be filled with the knowledge of the word, but not knowledge of him. Think about Paul. If you read scripture or heard any sermons, Paul was probably mentioned because he did so much. What did he do? Well, he basically brought the gospel to all of Europe and Asia Minor. Right? He was shipwrecked and saved from that, and nobody was lost. 
He was bit by a deadly snake. You know, he shook off in the fire, and they thought that it was amazing because they knew that he could have died from the poison in that snake. He raised one from the dead who fell out of a window. Some say that he was raised from the dead himself when he was stoned because they said he laid there as if he were dead, right? He saw Jesus on the road and it blinded him. He said that he went up to heaven and saw things that he wasn't even allowed to speak of or it would be unlawful or sinful for him to even speak of those things. So these are some of the things that Paul said that, he, that, that, that Paul had done. He wrote most of the New Testament, what is used for New Testament theology today. But at the end of the day in Philippians chapter 3, what did he say? He said, Paul, who did all these things, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul had a life that was full of works for the Lord. But at the end, what mattered most to him was knowing Jesus and his cross. Knowing the power of resurrection when he ultimately was going to die and be beheaded. This is the all-sufficiency that he knew when he was speaking to the church at Colossae. And in his own life that he said that. How can I think that we've arrived, any of us, when Paul is saying this at the end of his life? He should stir something up in us. Do I know him like Paul knew him before he said those words in Philippians chapter 3? The answer is probably no. I'm just going to be honest with you. So if he's still saying that at the end of Philippians... Where should we be with our heart to know him? Where should we be with our heart to fellowship with his sufferings? What does it mean to fellowship with his sufferings? It means this. When I go home and I'm exhausted and I'm tired and I want to sit down in front of the TV and I just want to watch the worst basketball in the world, the NBA. <laughs> but he's drawing me to my office to pray. The fellowship of his sufferings is me turning off the TV and going spending time with him. It's saying, not my will be done, but your will be done. And the reward that I'm going to receive for going to my office is far greater than getting mad at the brand of basketball I'm watching anyway. Right? That's the application. That's what that means to me. Look, this is the most profound statement that I can make. He is the point. We are to give him what he wants. We go back to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, with Mary and Martha. They invited Jesus into the house. He didn't want a sandwich, Martha. He wanted Martha. She didn't know what he wanted. Mary did. And he commended her for it. She has chosen the needful one thing, the needed part. And Martha was rebuked. You are troubled. You are distracted. You are worried by many things. We are to give him what he wants. Why preach the gospel? Because I believe right now in this time as we're nearing the end, even if the end is 100 years from now before his return, it doesn't matter. I believe he desires to have the gospel go forth. Because I believe as Christians, if you're, not, if you're an unbeliever today, you need to know that Jesus Christ died for you, that he shed his blood for you when he got on that cross, and that you likewise need to lay your life down before him and believe he did it for you out of the joy and love in his heart expressed to you. You need to repent of your sins today. Now is the time of salvation. Don't wait another moment. Right now is the time that you need to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and believe what the scripture say, says about him. That he is the needed one thing. And that he has a better plan for your life if it includes bondage to, to, to any chemical or to pornography or anything else. That's not his plan and desire for your life. He has better things in store for you. But I also believe as Christians who have been Christians for a long time that we have too quickly turned away from the gospel of Jesus Christ to other things. Other things that glitter our eyes. And we've lost the main thing. And my heart is burning and I believe he's put that desire in my heart to return to him as the main thing. If we don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, why would he bring the lost to you? He's bringing the lost to us. Because he knows he can trust us with giving them him. Does that make sense? In Acts chapter 2, well actually in Acts, all throughout Acts, but Acts chapter 2 verse 36, it says that they went and they preached Jesus. Acts chapter 2 36 says, let, therefore let all the house of Israel know this, 
that God has made the same Jesus who they crucified. This is the gospel. Jesus and Jesus crucified that God made him Lord and Christ. In Acts chapter 5, verse 42, they says this next one. Uh, I don't want to turn there. Go ahead, Garrett. Do you have that? And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. It says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached what? Christ to them. And then you can find it again in Acts chapter 12, in Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 20, whatever. I mean, it's over and over and over again. And the church grew because they were willing to preach Jesus everywhere that they went. They didn't change the message. The message was one, and it was one of him. Paul states it as well in all of his writings at least eight times. One of my favorite is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I am going to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 4. Paul says, I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, how Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul referring to? The Old Testament. What is the Old Testament about? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I'm delivering that to you according to scripture, scriptures, verse 4, and that Jesus was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas and then the 12, and after that he was seen of above 500 people at one time, of whom are still the greater part alive and present, but some have fallen asleep, meaning that they have died in that moment. That's how they use death. After that, he was seen of James and all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul is writing, as one born out of due time. And then in the same chapter, verse 24, Paul continues with the gospel message. He says, then the end will come. And there is a glorious high end of Second Peter, by the way. <laughs> but then the end will come when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. When is he doing that? When he returns to earth. That's when he's doing that. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy, therefore being death. For he has put all things under his feet. Why would Jesus send the sick into this house if we are unwilling to offer the remedy and pray for them and take a risk? No, we will pray. We will lay hands on the sick. We will believe in full faith that it is finished according to his word. And we will walk with you until that food is seen. Amen? Why would he send the oppressed to us, those who are bound, if we're not preaching the hope of salvation, freedom that is found in him alone? Salvation is a person, not a topic. I was sharing this last night with Mike in Luke chapter 2. It says of Simeon, he was an old man. And it was spoken to him by God that he would not die until he saw salvation. And then one day he was led by the Holy Spirit to the temple. And as he was led by the Holy Spirit to the temple, it happened to be the day that Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to present Jesus before the temple. And Simeon went over there and he picked up Jesus and held him. And he had the moment the Lion King ripped off, right? Holding Jesus. And what does he say about it, about him? He goes, now I can die, for my eyes have seen salvation. Salvation is a him. Salvation is Jesus. It's not a prayer. It's not an altar. He can meet you there, but, but the only way to get saved is if you do meet him there. Salvation is a him, and it's the Lord. Paul preached Christ and Christ crucified. Christ without the cross is just philosophy. The cross without Christ is just works. It's producing your own covering and it's legalism. It has to be both, Christ and him crucified. You and I can make all the new sets of rules or find some newfound self-discipline. All we want, it won't matter because ultimately all you're doing is trying something and that will never work. The only one who transforms is Jesus Christ, the one-step process. And for us to be transformed, John 15, we need to abide in him and his word and to stay in him and his word. I'm equipping you now in this moment, and I'm trying to stir you to faith for this very reason in the real Jesus of the Bible who came and died and gave it all up for an unfaithful bride and that he is returning for a faithful one that is pure and spotless. 
look, if we just give this teaching or that teaching and we say that somebody will get healed, well, if they just grab a hold of that teaching, they'll be healed. If they just grab a hold of that teaching, they'll be free. If they just grab a hold of that teaching, then they'll be saved. No. If they don't meet Jesus in the teaching, it's never going to matter. It's him. It's going through the crowd, pressing through the noise and the distraction to grab a hold of his hem of his garment that brought healing. It's being in his presence and only in his presence where he said, go, your faith has made you whole. And it's in his presence that it happens. We have to go to him. It's, it's him who we are after. We must get a hold of him. The teaching, if it doesn't lead to Jesus, it is not going to work. We can teach the mechanics of prayer and never know him. It happens all the time. Other religions pray all the time. We can teach faith and never know him who is the spirit of faith. We can teach the how to do something. But if the how, and I, I got this off a different preacher, if the how doesn't flow through the who, it will become an idol. And that has happened in too many churches, too many denominations, everywhere. The how has to flow through the who. It is his anointing. He just lets you wear it so often. The moment we walk around in our own strength thinking that we've accomplished something, we've missed it. And it's become a work of the flesh that burns up and it gives no value to Jesus Christ. Those words should ring true in our hearts. And they should make us shudder. Depart from me for I never knew you. And those are the ones who say, but Lord, we healed in your name. We cast out devils in your name. Lord, but I didn't know you. There's only one way to be known. is to be smeared and lathered and covered in the blood of Jesus. And that is it. Faithfully following him, listening to him, hearing him, and sitting at his feet. What's the application? Here's the application. Get alone. Jesus is not an activity. Jesus is not church. Although you can meet him there. And I pray you do. Or we are missing it and doing something wrong. If the Lord wants something, give it to him. What does that mean? I'm using myself as an example. <laughs> when I'm here on Sunday and Saturday nights, what the Lord wants, I don't have an option to not give him that. And last night, I didn't want to give him what he wanted because I felt like an idiot. Because I wasn't in the mood. I'm just being honest with you. Let's just be real. It's been tough. But I gave it to him. And the weak, pathetic version I gave to him, he honored anyway and showed me much grace. But if the Lord wants, for example, if he wants scripture, then read. How do we know? Ask him when you're in your alone time. You must have alone time with the Lord Jesus Christ. You must go in to meet him there. And in order to do that, you must stop talking and listen. Just ask him, Lord, what do you want? I will give it to you. If it's scripture, then read. If it's a song, then sing. If it's a dance, then dance. I've danced before the Lord many times. Not in front of you. <laughs> Being honest. If it's praise, then shout. If it's thanksgiving, then give it. If it's forgiveness, then forgive. The point is this. He sets the schedule. He chooses the songs that please him. Martha had Jesus in the room but did not know what he wanted. And what he wants matters. I know, and I don't, I'm not going to harp on this, I just want you to know that any change in schedule or songs or word or any of that regard nature is not flippant, is not a bug turning to light. It is being prayed over. It is being burdened over. And it has been shared for counsel. But I truly believe that, that what I'm speaking is the heart of the Lord, not just for this church, but for this community and for this nation. We need to stop looking as if the next political leader will solve issues. He won't. She won't. It's only the Lord. Doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for that. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't let people be aware and know the truth of policies. Absolutely we should. We should vote according to scripture, 100%. But they are still not our answer. Our answer is him. Matthew uh, chapter 5 verse 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Mm. 
Okay, no, I'm not done yet because you make sure that we have something queued up for the end next week, right? I don't know if we, I forgot to talk about that. Hungry and thirsting after righteousness, Jesus says they shall be filled. Look, this, this is one of the Beatitudes. Are we aware of that? Can I just say this without being, uh, I don't know, I'm not trying to make anybody angry. But we should know more about the Beatitudes than we do, I don't know, worshiping with flags. Right? We should know more about the Beatitudes than we do the kingdom of darkness. We should know more about the Beatitudes and Jesus Christ the Lord than blowing the shofar. And by the way, I've done all those. I'm not speaking against those. But everything needs to be in its rightful place. Does that make sense? This is the seminal sermon and message ever that was given. Right? I heard it said one time that the Beatitudes are like the Declaration of Independence and the rest is the Constitution or the Magna Carta, however you want to say it, of the Sermon on the Mount. This should be in us more than any other doctrine. Jesus saw fit to release this to the world first. And what he's doing when he speaks out of the abundance of the heart that now speaks, he's sharing his heart. But he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Not feeling full, but actually filled. My question is, how is your hunger for he who is righteous? Everything about Jesus is right. And there's a right way to come to him. There's a right way to worship him. There's a right way to see him. And because of that, we can be right as well because we are in him. And that's the only way we can be right. He is the problem solver. But if we only come to him because we have a problem or to solve problems, we're missing it. It says in Matthew chapter 6 that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is God's righteousness? A better question is, who is God's righteousness? It's Jesus Christ. And when we seek first the kingdom of God and Jesus, his righteousness, then all these things are added unto you. Problems are solved. It has to go to him first. It has to. His righteousness invites us to hunger because when we get him, we get filled. And when we get filled, we get the more. We get the outpouring. We get revival. We get the gifts. We're not just reading the Bible for the Bible's sake. We are reading the Bible for his sake, understanding that it is his heart. And if we turn from the teachings of Scripture, we're actually turning from Jesus Christ himself. It grieves my heart when I talk to somebody and they say, well, I don't really understand the Bible, so I don't read it. How can you know Jesus? Because you can't know Jesus through somebody else. You can't know Jesus because I'm up here talking to you about Jesus. You just can't. It's impossible. Or uh, you heard say, I love Jesus. I just don't love the Bible. There's things in there I don't agree with. Then you don't love Jesus. But it's said. It's, it's said all the time now. The Bible is for him. It's through his word that we get to know his heart. And through that, we know through scripture, he's revealing the Father. We read about it in Colossians chapter 1. It's how we see the invisible God. It's how we see the Father himself. I'm almost done. I hope this is bearing some fruit today for you guys. There are those who believe you get enough of Jesus to eke out your way into heaven. Or you get enough of Jesus to move on to other things. The problem is we gain knowledge of the kingdom, but we lose sight of the king himself. There's a natural principle here. Did anybody hear? Um, wait a minute. That's a politically charged question. I can't ask that. Um, okay, how do I say this? Just think of it. Lots of people. Thanks, Karen. The confidence exuded from her comment right there. If you've ever gotten a flu shot, I'm just going to say this in the COVID one, right? If you've ever gotten a flu shot, what is the point of a true vaccine? The point of a true vaccine and inoculation is to give you just enough of something so that you become immune to it, Right? Well, I believe in the church, we've gotten just enough of Jesus and the power of the cross and moved away from it that we become numb and immune to it. We've been inoculated to Jesus and the power of the cross. Does that make sense? And that principle works. But the truth is that we are to be becoming more childlike. If he says it, we believe it. And that's it. I'm going to close here with my journey. <laughs> my journey. Sounds so funny, like I'm old. Not old. I did see my friend Mike last night, and I said, hey, when did this happen? He's got some gray in his beard and his hair. He's younger than me. Wisdom. 
He, see, see, he's childlike. He read in the word about gray beards. He's like, Lord, I'm there. I believe it. Boom, there it was. Man, God, I want to believe that. No, I don't. I said, look, I don't mind gray. I don't want to be bald. You know, there's a difference. But, and here's why. My daughter is afraid of bald people. You know, I'm just being honest. And so I, I don't want to be afraid of me, right? I said, Haley, that's completely, utterly ridiculous. She goes, I don't know. I just don't think, I don't know. I'm like, Robbie Dawkins was bald. Yeah, but I like him. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I don't get it. But anyway, so Lord Jesus, you hear her heart, and I'm in agreement with her heart. I, I don't want, anyway. Here's my journey. I'm just going to give you my spiritual journey. I am 44 and a half. I'll be 45 in December, right? So I'm, I'm a youngin. I got 80 more years, 75 more years, right? Oh, unless the Lord comes before that, then I'll just be with him. The church that I grew up in, I learned about tongues, and it was fantastic. I didn't know anything, I didn't know anything different. Tongues and interpretation. You know what else I learned about in the church I grew up in? Jericho marches. Song will come on, and all of a sudden it's like a conga line through the aisle. Speaking Jesus. The Lord reigneth. I mean, Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we just we just walked. We just walked. We just walked. We replaced the carpet after that night, I think, because it was so worn. And I learned about these things. And that's how I grew up. I grew up in the fervency of the Spirit, but I had no understanding of the fervency of the Spirit. I didn't really understand the Holy Spirit. And that his actual purpose is to glorify Jesus. Jesus said that himself in John. And then after that, I went through a time period of being lost. And hooked on myself and the lust of the flesh. And I've shared that openly in college. And then there came the Billy Graham crusade where I found the power of worship in the word. Worship so captivated me that when I went to the Billy Graham crusade for the first time, I heard Hillsong was there and Darling Check's song, Shout to the Lord, and it wrecked me. I was living a life of lost and just full of self and lust and, and I knew it was wrong because I was raised with the Jericho marches. Of course you know it's wrong, right? Those walls should be falling down. And I'm building up these walls of self and flesh and lust. And shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. And I just prayed, oh God, let this melody never leave my heart. And I would mow that summer. And all of a sudden I'd be having a bad day. And, and going back to the things that I was doing. And that melody would rise up in my heart. And it says in the Psalms that, that our song, we do fight with that. Like the song we sang today, that our weapon is a melody. That is scriptural. When you lose your song, you lose your ability to fight. And so that started to rise up in me, the, the worship. And, and what I knew was always there, the Lord unlocked to a greater degree. You are a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. So much so that years and years later, just a few years ago, actually, I went to a church. I didn't know anything about the church or we were going with some friend of ours who invited us. And the pastor of the church, who's been a longtime pastor, just came up to me. I don't know anything about him. And he looked at me, and he just kind of stared at me, like, you know, like side-eyed, because he was talking to the friend that we brought because he knew each other. And he, just, he just kept looking at me. I'm like, you know, checking everything, whatever. And he goes, you are a worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never met him before. That word of knowledge just confirmed what I already knew. So confirmation words are fantastic, and they're great. It helps you know that you're on the right path. After that, there was a time period in my life when I came to this church, and it was a prophecy. And three main prophecies I've shared them before hit me so strong. Two from Vaughn Clark, who is now with the Lord, and one from Tim, my, my brother-in-law. And it was so powerful, and they brought healing, physical and spiritual, two of the words. And the other one was a warning and guided my path. And so then there was that time in my life. And then after the time of prophecy in my life, I don't know why I'm looking at my notes, I'm just going to forget me. The foundation of faith began to rise in its, in its finished work in the word. A foundation of faith that I had not heard or, or had poured into me before. Growing up with Jericho marches, it's great, but it can be emotional. Not every Jericho march is led of the Spirit. Can I just say that? Just because we get out in the aisles and walk around doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is doing something. Not every shout is loud of the Holy Spirit. Not every hallelujah it means praise be to God in that moment. It's said in vain. It's religious activity. That happens. I understand that. But what was great in this opportunity that I had to build a foundation of faith upon the word of God is now I had scripture. And the Lord did in me now. So if you come to me and you talk to me and you start talking about a doctrine, you start talking about an experience, it's like the Lord just brings up uh, uh, scripture after scripture after scripture confirming and denying what you're speaking of. I don't know if everybody gets that. 
but that's in conversations. That's what happens with me, because it's it's so in me. But if it's in me just to be in me, and it's not of Him, well then I can use that to beat somebody down. I can use that and be a resounding gong without love. But this is a time of growing in the foundation of faith and, and in His Word that was very pivotal in my life, hundred percent. And then after that, Kendall and I went to a conference in Chicago. I was blown away by some of the ministers who were there in words of knowledge. And I, 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 I signed up for an online course on words of knowledge. I read two books on words of knowledge. I started giving words of knowledge because I was hungry and seeking words of knowledge. I was like, Lord God, this is you speaking to their heart. And all of a sudden, their eyes are open, and they believe you're real, and you can heal them. And then after you heal them, you can invite them to say, look, you just met Jesus. Do you want to know him personally? And that was powerful. And I went after it 100%. And then I had the revelation of the lost and the needy and that we are all called to go out. Doesn't mean we all have a gifting of evangelism, but we're all called to go out and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But every single one of those phases in my life, the Lord has surgically. So if you think of a funnel, right? And the funnel goes down, and then you have the sin. All of those are funnel experiences. And, and I told you a few weeks ago, I felt like the Lord just ripped into my soul, and he pulled out everything that wasn't him. And he said, This is what I want. And I was like, oh, that's not a whole lot left, God. But that's the point. All of that was done with Jesus in the background. Everything, I, my whole life journey, and all of it was good. Not the lost part, not the lust part. But all of the spiritual journey was good. But Jesus was in the background. Jesus was inferred. A few months ago, marked a change in my life where I am unwilling to let Jesus be the understood or inferred part any longer. He is the main part. He is the needed part. And then the Lord brought back to my mind the vision of the funnel. And he said, now, turn the funnel upside down. Now that this is the main part, everything can flow from me and not in these pieces, and the rest is restored. That's the church I want. He is the needed part, the one thing. He is above all. He is the first commandment. He is the all-sufficient one. He is the returning one. He is heaven's song, and he is the Father's only sermon. That is it. I desire a church and leaders that are passionately in love with Jesus, and the outflow of that relationship with Jesus is ministry. It is his ministry day. He is why we gather. It is not about us. Every ministry, Bible study, outreaches, prayer, hospitality, youth, young adults, freedom, every single ministry, Jesus needs to be the main part and the needed part, the needed one thing. And out of him, the deliverances, the door knocks, the opening of scripture. He still is the only book opener. Revelation. As we see him rightly and we give him his right place and we fear him, I believe, this is my heart, that the magnitude and frequency of the gifts will only increase because now they will be in their proper place and flowing from the proper source. But we don't exist for that. We exist for him. Amen? Amen. Please stand with me. Prayer team, you go ahead and come on up. I get it. I understand there's a lot to process this morning. But I don't want you to miss the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is a very simple drawing. Maybe when I talked about the funnel, you feel similarly. You can go back through your life journey and see the different points in your life where the Lord has brought you. You can see at one point where this song brought you to tears and now you can't stand to hear it. Or you can see at one point where, you know, seeing repentance or, or someone being healed, you know, moved you, but now it doesn't. Why? That's just the question, why? Is it because our eyes have turned on to the healing or turned on to the salvation and moved away from him himself? I would love to see us draw back to the Lord and from that place move back out. It's very simple. It's very simple. I think the kingdom of God is moving that direction. I think the world needs that. 
If I'm offering healing without the healer, am I really offering anything at last? No, then he's going to die anyway. And then what? Not that healing isn't God's will. I'm not saying that. It's totally his will. If you don't believe it's his will and that he's able, then you've not read scripture. But it's not the end all be all. It says that the end of our faith is the salvation of our soul. It's him. Because he is salvation. So if you have a need today, whether it's a physical need, whether it's an emotional need, whether it's a mental need, the attack of the enemy upon mental wellness or well-being is great. It is large. We're here to agree with you. We're here to pray with you. We're here to believe the Lord with you for that deliverance and that healing. Father God, I just thank you. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for being willing to do the hard thing. Lord, I thank you for being willing to be humble. Lord, because you are the humble king. Lord, I thank you that there's a way forward. And that's you. Jesus, help us to turn our eyes to you. To see you rightly. To hunger and thirst after you. The righteousness of God. It says, you said that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to have an understanding that the end is nearing, either for us physically when we are with you or for your return. Either way, Lord God, that time is short and that we are to be looking and longing for the return of the bridegroom and that while we are here, we are to be laboring because the harvest is ripe. Jesus, I love you. We love you. You are the Lord of this church. You are the Lord of what is said and what is done. Let that be the case with every preparation, with every prayer, with every relationship, and with every conversation, Lord, in Jesus' name.